what is the single most important self-care tool? Now, if you had asked me that not too long ago, I would have said resistance bands or a Swiss ball or who knows. What do you think it is? Well, our guest this week is a body worker with background in all kinds of different modalities, from clinical massage therapy to holistic nutrition to acupuncture, to Chinese medicine, to Reiki, yoga, and beyond. His answer was a foam roller and silence. And in this episode, he'll break down exactly why this is such a high impact, important tool everyone should be using daily. We talk about how he chose the different disciplines that he specializes in now to study, how he combines those different disciplines different forms of therapeutic body work and the benefits beyond pleasure and feeling good, the opportunities afforded to him when he hit rock bottom, what he views as some of the most underrated modalities and tools and biohacks, such as moxibustion, the power of our language, our words, and how to use reframes to rewire our beliefs on the deepest level and create lasting change. All that and much more with Key Retif. He's a renowned healer with expertise in massage therapy, holistic nutrition, acupuncture, and Chinese medicine. He has earned significant credentials, including diplomas from Sutherland Chan and the Ontario College of Traditional Chinese Medicine, as well as certifications in key healing practices like Reiki and yoga. Known for his holistic approach, Key attracts clients globally because the results clients get from his transformative healing treatments speak for themselves. You can find the links to everything we discuss, his work, websites, and socials, and a whole lot more in the show notes for this episode, which are at mindbodypeak.com slash 152. By the way, if you hear the mooing in the background, that's because I'm in a small rural village in India. I have a lot of good things to say about India for my trip so far, but quiet background noise isn't necessarily one of them. This episode is brought to you by the Outlier Longevity Challenge. After seeing thousands of people aging prematurely, suffering from low energy, high stress, and just living below their potential, I've written extensively about all of the latest longevity supplements and ingredients. And here's the thing. While many of them are promising, they don't outweigh the benefits and transformative power of following a well-structured, intelligently designed program. The fanciest longevity designer molecules, whether it's rapamycin, metformin, urolithin A, these are all great, but on a magnitude scale, if they are about a two or three, then the highest impact things are going to be an eight or nine. And the high impact things have fewer side effects, more benefits, really spillover benefits. They're oftentimes fairly simple and sometimes even free. So if you feel confused by the world of longevity, you see some of the influencers out there spending hundreds of thousands on their protocols, or in certain cases, such as with Brian Johnson, up to $2 million on his longevity routine, know that there's a better way. So I created a short 14-day longevity challenge where I lay out in each day one of the highest impact fundamentals you can work on, and I give you more actionable things to do without consuming your whole day, just a few minutes per day can make a difference, and less on the theory side, although I have plenty of that if you're interested as well. Some of the longevity courses I've been through and also seen cost thousands of dollars. And this is not that, since longevity shouldn't cost you an arm and a leg or your entire savings. So I've actually taken 60% off the course for the launch and the first 500 sales. So if you click the link down below, you'll automatically unlock 60% off and qualify for a free one-on-one consult with me. If you happen to be watching this after the first 500, no problem you'll still experience an incredible transformation if you follow through on the action items in the program. The beta testers so far have shown some impressive improvements to their blood biomarkers and their biological age tests. So check it out. And if you have any questions, reach out to me on the Outlier website at outlier.com slash contact. All right, 
Ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation with Key. Key, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, brother. Thanks for having me on. I've been looking forward to this because a lot of people talk about holistic health and they might do some lab testing and possibly use supplements or herbs, but it's not like a true holistic picture of health. And when I was reviewing your work, I noticed that you have a thorough pro process and you integrate a lot of things from different disciplines and different medical systems. So I'm excited to dive into that with you today. Before we get started, as a warm up, what are the unusual non negotiables you've done so far for your health, your performance and your bioharmony today? For my health, probably like, I call them healthy hobbies. And just like little practices that keep me away from, keep me busy, uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, keep me out of trouble. Uh, it's like I used to, you know, be a big partier and these healthy hobbies, like say slacklining or juggling or hand balancing, these things keep my body healthy, keep my mind sharp and, uh, yeah, keep me feeling good, make me happy. And yeah, I mean, other practices like stillness, meditation, really, really important, just being able to calm the mind and slow down and then just like eating, eating things that make me feel good. So like, I love eating food for the way it makes me feel and not for the taste. Of course, I want to make it taste good too. But like, I don't know, like eating when I eat liver, it's like a spiritual experience. I like feel it nourish my deficiencies. And it's like, oh, like, and I mean, I eat it with my hands and uh, I make it with half Frank's half raw butter. It's like a really nice sauce, eat it with my hands. And then, but yeah, when I eat that, I like really feel it nourish my soul. It's like a spiritual experience. So, uh, yeah, I'm just con connecting with nature, trying to enjoy life, moving slow, just like trying to be chill, trying to be gentle on yourself. So yeah, just trying to enjoy the experience that we're blessed with. Yeah. And if you look at the net pleasure gain from the food that you eat that's clean and healthy and that you feel nourishing yourself, it might not have the same temporary spike. You may not get quite as much pleasure in the short term and you might not uh, enjoy it quite as much as some people enjoy their junk food. But if you look at like what happens after on the other end of that spike, the, the trough, the valley afterward of energy and like brain fog and a bunch of different things like that, I think the, the better more pleasurable even alternative is to eat clean. I see that you're wearing a shirt that says longevity. What's the significance of that? My friend gave it to me, but big fan of playing the long game. So I, uh, I think life is a marathon, not a race. And I think like, you know, I, I plan to be a centenarian and I used to work so hard to, to get where I wanted to be and would just like run myself into burnout. And it's just unnecessary. It makes life, you know, I was always like living in the future, like rushing to get somewhere when really like the journey itself is the destination. Yeah. And that reminds me of what you were just saying before about your habits that you have, their practices that you now enjoy. How did you transition from partying into doing all these holistic things that people often consider a uh, nuisance, such as meditating? Now it sounds like you look forward to it and it's like an integral part of your day. Well, basically hitting the rock bottom, which is uh, kind of a beautiful day because it's the last time you'll ever accept going that low. And really, it's like, in, it's, it's really up to you because like, I believe like there's like good and bad is kind of like, not really. It's like your choice, your choice. And sometimes like the worst things, the worst experiences lead you to your greatest gifts. So like, I just decided like enough is enough. Like I'm ready. So then I had this epiphany while I was lying in my bed, uh, on ketamine and, and, uh, yeah, I was like, okay, like I just got to stop doing drugs and partying and, and, uh, focus on fitness and I'll never have to work another day in my life. I didn't know what that meant, but I was like, okay. So then the next day I just booked a yoga teacher training and, and kind of just started like a health journey. Well, tell me more about your background. I mean, that's how you got started and where did that path take you? 
Yeah, so I used to be in the military and had a really bad back injury, fell 14 feet, almost died, near-death experience, which was really, really uh, interesting. Um, had like I was like free-falling from 14 feet up, like looking at the sky, like being like, oh, this is it, like I'm about to die. And uh, crazy DMT release in the brain, hit the ground, didn't die. So I was like, oh, sweet, like every day is a bonus now. And, uh, yeah, then I ended up getting like really bad back pain, debilitating back pain so bad that I like wanted to commit suicide. And this is like after my yoga teacher training, I was already like on the health journey and then did a, ended up going to massage therapy school, two year program, uh, in Canada, we have like the highest level of massage therapy in the world. It's, uh, kind of like a master's program, quite, it's quite hard. Uh, and I learned so much. It was really great. And like six months into that, uh, found my purpose in life to become a healer at an ayahuasca ceremony. And then basically just like dedicated my life to being in service of humanity and helping others heal and learned how to heal myself after like, you know, hitting, hitting another rock bottom of a different rock bottom of like, okay, like I'm in so much pain and I really don't want to continue this life anymore. And considering committing suicide and never did and eventually realized how to heal myself and that it was me all along because I was spending tens of thousands of dollars on every kind of practitioner going to them being like you know I am like owning owning this this injury and this pain because I would say like I am in so much back pain I have so much back pain and just like you know using these unconscious words of ownership and eventually like after seeing all these people realizing that it was me all along and that it was in my power all along but it didn't help like seeing one doctor and they're telling me one thing and then like you know a physio is telling me one thing and a chiropractor is telling me the complete opposite thing and so it's like wow who do I listen to and then uh, eventually I found some exercises that really helped and tapped into my own intuition and you know crazy journey too because trying every single diet I was like not eating for 10 days or vegan, vegetarian, carnivore, like tried everything and then eventually realized balance is, is like the most important thing. No, I think diet, exercise, sleep, those tend to be what get the most limelight, most attention and focus. But that was actually something that I wanted to double click into with you because I heard you earlier mention about the words you were using with yourself and presumably the story behind those words. So let's explore that together. I'm curious to hear why, like what that was like for you, what those words and thoughts and stuck emotions were and what they felt like and how you worked through that. Well, when I was in the military, when I got out, I, I was receiving, I was on disability for a while and I would go to the doctor and like explain the pain that I was in and I wasn't lying, but also at the same time, like I didn't want to lose the money I was getting. And so I would like, I kept myself in this like low frequency because of that. And I would like keep explaining to the doctor, like, yeah, I have so much pain. Like I'm in so much pain. And then I realized like, this is a big problem with, with like the military folk and veterans and stuff, because it really keeps you in this low vibrational state after like, if you're a veteran and you're getting uh, like compensation from the military and like, you're getting free money. It's like, Oh, like I don't need to work. I'm okay. But then that like takes your life away from you. Like it really, really causes huge problems in your life because yes, like you're okay. You can live like an okay, comfortable life, but it's not fulfilling. And when it's not fulfilling, uh, you're you're empty inside and when you're empty inside life isn't that good your heart is empty and and you feel you just you don't feel you're just like you're numb to the world and and you know deep down something's missing and you cannot truly be happy when you're in that state i recorded a podcast a while back with the enlifted team and we talked about the power that words have on like literally shaping our story which shapes our reality what is the issue with saying I am about those type of disempowering things? I am or I have. And what is the the reframe that you started to use with yourself? It create like whatever you say after I am, you 
that creates your identification, you owning that, you become that. That's why Jesus just said, I am, and then nothing after, because he realized he was all things. And like, so whatever you say after that, it's, it's really dangerous. So if you're a vegan, which I was, I was like, I'm vegan. I identified myself as a vegan. Therefore, I put myself in a box. I created limits in my life because I was like, okay, I'm only going to eat this, even though like my body needed all kinds of vitamins and minerals and proteins that were outside of the diet that I was eating. I limited myself to that and created this identity around that. So the more identity that you give yourself, the less you can know who you truly are. So what did you do then to reframe that? Instead of saying, I am whatever it was, when that thought came up or that those words are about to come out, what would you do instead? I mean, we all slip up, like you were just saying, like even when you know and practice it, like still sometimes you say things and you're like, oh, like, and you, you, you just try to catch yourself as much as you can or like even rebuke something that you, you, that you put out in the universe that you didn't want to say. It's like, oh man, like, and, and you can just, I don't know, say something else. And basically it's like, there's a tipping point and whatever you say more and is, is really what's going to manifest eventually. So you just want to be on the, the right side of things to where you want to be. Okay. So after you, got your story straight and you worked on the words that you're telling yourself because those are things that we the words the possibly negative thoughts come up all the time every day and they just like affirm your current situation or whatever it is the energy behind those words so if you're telling yourself that you're a fake or you don't deserve this or whatever you're telling yourself that from the first thing you do in the morning to the last thoughts at night of course your life is going to mold and shape around those thoughts in a way you wouldn't necessarily want. So after you worked on that, what did you do next? I think all of it is just like a daily practice and trying to be consistent and just trying to be the best you can. So it's like, wasn't really like, what am I doing next? It's like, just every day trying to do the best that I can and trying to enjoy life and like not going overboard, not being excess. And, you know, I guess it's just rhythms and, Really, like I'm just trying to enjoy the journey, man. Like that's it. Like I'm just I'm just trying to help people at, while I'm helping myself at the same time, and and just like do do the best I can given the given the cards I've been dealt. Really, like and and having fun while I'm at it. So, you know, I guess like each each year comes in waves. Like I love like a theme for every year. So like for me, 2022 was sobriety. 2023 was consistency, and this year it's like patience and like slowing down and stepping back, letting go kind of thing. So I'm just trying to like, yeah, just, just, just trying to be a little bit better every day. Like that's it. And, and, and being gentle, like being nice to my nervous system. Cause there's just so much out there. That's just like, da, 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 da. so like the more I can just like do nothing and allow the, the nothingness to heal me because really like we have all the answers within and there's just so much trying to take our attention, especially now with this crazy technology boom in this decade that uh, I'm just trying to like allow the things to happen and not, not get FOMO from, uh, you know, missing out on all these opportunities that are happening with, with AI and all these things. And I'm trying to stay like on top of the stuff, but at the same time, like just trying to be gentle and like create the the most enjoyable life i can while providing a beautiful service for humanity how did the modalities that you now offer come into your life because you have a huge catalog of things that you use and do and i'd assume that before you started offering them to clients you started really practicing them and learning them on yourself yeah. So I guess they came through phases. Always loved working out movement and sports and stuff. So I first felt like I first found yoga. Then I ended up going to massage school. And then during that had a, had a spiritual awakening. And then like, you know, massage can be really hard work doing body work for people. And it's not something I really wanted to do as a career. So I decided to look into Chinese medicine to practice acupuncture. It's a little easier on the body. And then like 
I fell absolutely fell in love with it and realized how powerful it is. And it's like my absolute favorite medicine. And I also went to India to study Ayurveda. Uh, I met these guys who introduced me to sauna and ice baths and breathwork as well. And they hired me to host ceremonies with them. And really like all of my drug and party use as a child growing up and numbing my numbing my childhood and crazy experiences turned out to be training for me being able to hold space for people and use these medicines in a therapeutic way. So these guys were hiring me to host ceremonies with them using psilocybin and ketamine. And then I started incorporating like movement, breath work, body work, sound, acupuncture into these ceremonies. So then people are having these like life-changing experiences and, uh, yeah, I've been kind of working with that and uh, just playing around with all these different modalities and combining them. And because like I wanted to be the kind of person where, you know, like you, like sometimes you'd go to a doctor and they're like, yeah, go see this person or go see this person or like a medical doctor. I mean, you're not going to get much other than four minutes in a prescription. So but, like I want when someone comes to me, like I want to truly help people. And I believe that like if someone is open, I can help them 100% no matter what. And like, and, and I didn't want to have to send someone away. Like I want to be able to help the person. So I also did a, a year of holistic nutrition schooling for, for the dietary stuff. And she learned more in my one uh, East West diet class from Chinese medicine school than I did in a full year of Chinese medicine. I mean, a full year of uh, holistic nutrition because they talk about uh, like the constitution of foods, and I think it's more important. Can you talk about that? I haven't. I've talked about Chinese medicine a little bit on the show and a little bit about Ayurveda, but not much about the like food typing. I th I think like it, we just need to take the best parts of each medicine because there's so many disagreements between all the medicines. So it's like you know Chinese medicine says we're not supposed to take ice baths, but I mean if if you're into the new age healing stuff, like you know how or you've tried one, you know how incredible ice baths are, truly are, like for so many reasons and sauna and all like, so yeah, I think it's just take the best parts of all the things and, and just be open. Like, don't, don't close yourself off to, to something. And like a lot of people will go to say a chiropractor or a physio and they're like, they're one of those types that just go to work and they don't are like maybe not passionate or they're just not good or they don't give a good treatment. And then someone will judge the whole modality of healing on one practitioner. So I've had that experience with myself too. And then going to different schoolings, it's like out of the 60 people I graduated massage school with, there's only three of them who I would actually pay for treatment and like feel good about it. And same with Chinese medicine school, like uh, a lot of the students are scared to needle. So then like they're putting the fear into that needle inside the person. And it's like, okay, like, so it's, it's, hard. it's not easy to find a good practitioner. Like it's, it's not easy. So it takes consistency and repetition to actually find like the, the tools that you need to, to flip that switch and have that realization in your brain. Or like, you know, maybe you're lucky and you find someone that can truly help you right away. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's like, yes, people can help you, but the only person that can truly help us is ourselves because we need to be open for the healing. And then we have to do the lifestyle choices to continue that path and to stay, to, to stay on the path or else we'll just fall back into the, the patterns. It's like losing weight. Like if you lose weight, what, like if you lose something, then we, we look for it, we find it again. So the only way to truly, like if you're obese and to become skinny is you have to release the weight and change your identity and become a different person. Like you have to see yourself as that skinny person or whatever person you want to be and become that person and do the habits or else if you don't, then you're just going to find the weight that you lost again. How do you reconcile differences between like the modern science and some of the ancient systems or even when the ancient systems clash and they have different perspectives on something, say the ice bath, like do you do some like practices to like quote, mitigate harm from a Chinese perspective or do you just discard their concern and say that it's probably outdated they didn't have ice baths the same way that we do and now we have better technologies I just trust my feeling I I, be, I believe feeling is the highest form of communication and I just trust that beliefs are are 
dangerous because like whatever you believe you're right no matter what it is because you in your head you're right so because we're we create a reality and our perception of reality is what's real and for us so uh yeah it can be a blessing or a curse it all depends but. on days that you don't feel like ice bathing i'm gonna assume there's probably some of those do you know that it's like a feeling of resistance to something that might benefit you and be and feel good afterward like how do you reconcile that difference in feeling because a lot of people myself included a lot of times the thought of ice bathing doesn't feel good but like it's it's the feeling on the other end of it that does for me it's apprehension so i have apprehension before every single ice bath i've never not had apprehension before an ice bath and i've done probably close to a thousand of them and i just don't think I close my mind off and I love to do like a really hot sauna before or like get super hot to the point where like I'm ready to pass out and then just like and then I just go rinse off if I'm in like a communal like sauna ice bath space or something and then I don't think I just get it I like just close the minds even even doing acupuncture on myself because I I love practicing acupuncture on myself and like some, it hurts, like some of it hurts. And a lot of acupuncturists will say it doesn't hurt, but I'm, I'm a very strong needler and I'm a deep needler and, and, uh, it hurts. And so I always have apprehension, but I just like try not to think about it and just do it. Cause I find like the apprehension is worse than the actual thing. And then like, once we're in it, like it's all good and we can breathe through anything. Like pain is subjective and, and yeah, we can, we can breathe through anything. Yeah, it makes sense. There's a lot of different ways. And and I figure like most people have apprehension about going into <laughs> really, really cold water. So that makes sense. And okay. And then sauna. Yeah, that's a contrast therapy like that. Alternating between the hot and cold has a lot of benefits. I'm a big fan of that. I don't know if there is an ancestral take on the idea of contrast therapy. Yeah, like they've been using sauna for like 2000 plus years originating in Finland. And then like, the ice baths have been used for healing for a long time as well, but not really taking off until like recently. And yeah, definitely more research on saunas than ice baths. So since you have such a large repertoire of tools, I'm curious, obviously it's very bio individual, but if I was to come to you, like what would your process be? Like, I know you obviously do some kind of diagnostics and then you'd decide on where to go from there. Like what would the, a to z look like i mean it really depends why why you come but really like my normal session that i do for someone like if they just book a two-hour session with me i just i i will basically do a grind through their whole body like a full body deep tissue treatment i don't think when i do it i just allow my hands to do the thinking for me i completely close off my mind and just allow intuition to take over. And uh, yeah, the desired outcome pretty much always happens. So I'll just like basically like steamroll the body, move the skeletal system where it needs to go, release all the big trigger points, and the body just corrects itself. And then uh, put needles where I think they need to go, and then do like a really deep sound bath. And yeah, after that, like the body like resets itself, the body will realign itself. A lot of things get released. Uh, Crazy things happen. Like I've had, I don't know, someone like six months postmenopausal, like start having their cycle again. That was their intention. I've had like someone who had like childhood trauma from being sexually abused like stored in their hips i just released what was in the hip and then all of a sudden this girl was like yeah can you tell my friend to come in here and uh after this after the session and uh yeah she told her friend about sexual abuse that she was holding on to since she was like a child and like kind of knew not really or like i had like this other time went to this party one time and this girl she was really high on mdma i was sober and then she's just like, hey, like, come talk to me. And she was like, she's really high. And she like put her hands on my laps and started asking me all these really deep personal questions. And I'm like, oh, cool. Like, I love this, whatever. I'm, I'm an open book. So I started answering all her questions. And then I eventually told her about the sexual abuse I experienced when I was a kid. 
And then when I did, she was like, and then it like triggered a memory of her getting sexually abused by her father when she was three years old. And she had ovarian cancer two times. She's this girl's in her thirties. And obviously that is blocked energy stuck from this emotion that was inside the body of, you know, being sexually abused as a kid and the body never forgets, but the mind, when you experience these terrible things in childhood, the mind will block it out and push it away. So we don't have a lot of conscious memory of these things, especially really traumatic events, unless like something crazy happens, like uh, the use of, of medicines uh, are really helpful for bringing memories up, which is why I really love working with them because it helps people have really profound realizations in a faster amount of time. And it allows us to go deeper within the body. So, but yeah, this, this memory triggered in this girl when I, when I explained that I was sexually abused as a kid and then she told me about this. So then I was like, okay, we're, I'm at the party and I had some acupuncture needles in my bag. I always have them in my bag and I decided to give her a little bit of treatment. So I went into the room, started doing some abdominal work, energy work, and then like doing really deep massage directly on her ovaries and then I like put a bunch of needles in her stomach a treatment called the front wheel of life and uh, and then just allowing her to cry and talk and she was just going off talking and crying and then like as I was doing some work on her ovary all of a sudden we heard a like a little pop and her ovary activated and this girl was taking est- she was taking uh, birth control just to produce estrogen because her body couldn't produce it anymore. Her, her ovaries were not working. And then all of a sudden her ovary just like, it just activated all of a sudden and it started Whoa. working again. And yeah, that was really cool. And it's like that time I did have this intention of like, okay, like specifically sending love into this area and, and la dee da. But like, I'm, when I'm working with people, I'm completely unattached to an outcome. I shut my brain off and just allow whatever needs to happen to happen because I learned the hard way when you're trying really hard, uh, you can open yourself up to taking on their energy. So this is, this is where it's dangerous for, it's dangerous to be empathetic as a healer, because if you're an empath and a healer, then you open yourself up to taking on someone else's energy, because what's the definition of empathetic, literally feeling for somebody. So I just treat and the secret to not taking it on is just good posture, good breathing, and just like an open, loving heart. I could also see if you were attached to an outcome, you might be overriding her body, her nervous system's like highest priority. It might be like this part down here. But if you're insisting that you focus all your love and energy on this one part of the body, it might the energy will go there. And instead of healing what actually needed to be healed at the root, you might be healing something more superficial. Yeah, that's a good point. I never thought of that. Tell me about the the role of massage and body work because I, for a while, had the th- opinion that it was just like a relaxation tool. But as you've described with your own experience and from my own experiences going deeper within using it more or receiving it more, I should say, I've realized that there's a lot to it. There's like the lymphatics, there's the uh, like there's acupressure from the massage itself, not acupuncture, but acupressure. There's like potential posture improvements and changes. There's realignments. What are like the reasons that people come to massage aside from just feeling really nice? Well, I mean, you, you kind of said it yourself in the question. You're like, you know, massage and then body work, like it's work. And then like, so there's like, a, you know, a relaxation massage. Someone goes and gets some oil rubbed on them. And that's like a relaxation massage. That is not what I do. If someone comes to see me for a treatment, they're going to experience pain and they're going to have to feel these things that are stuck in their body. Like it's not comfortable. We all have these spots where we hold stress. These are like buttons where uh, emotions and things get stuck in the body. So like, for instance, in the chest right here, our brachial plexus goes under the pec minor muscle and gets stuck. And a lot of people don't know how to breathe. So every time you're breathing, instead of using the diaphragm, you're using this muscle and it gets more and more stuck. So like, just like releasing that area will release all the nerves, veins, and arteries to the arm. And if like that's stuck compressing the nerves, veins, and arteries, then it leads to numbness, tingling, even weakness. If a, if a nerve is like 
has compression on it, it leads to weakness because it's the nerves that give the muscles the juice. So it's like, if there's like a kink in a hose, you're not going to have enough flow at the end or corrosion in an electrical system, you're not going to have the same wattage. So the same thing inside the body, the more things are compressed, the less circulation. So, and the less circulation, the less we're going to, we're not going to function as well. So it's like all of our organs, everything, it doesn't matter. So like one thing down here can affect the whole entire body. So like you find a button on the body that's stuck and you press the button and release it, you're removing a blockage and everything is going to function better. And you don't even know what's going to happen. Like you might press a button and release it and then get this crazy head rush and vertigo and like this like crazy experience. And it's not bad. That's healing. That is stuck energy in the body moving. It's similar to yoga. Like yoga is like created to open the body up to prepare it for meditation so we can achieve these higher states. And then body work is same thing, opening up the body so we can achieve these higher states and these desired states. So it's it's like, I kind of see it in a similar way as that. It's just like creating space in the body so we can be our best selves. And touch is absolutely important. It is one of it's most people's love language. It's like, it's up there. It's a necessary human need that we, we all have. And if we don't have it for a long time, even if you don't like touch because of some childhood trauma, deep down, you need it. Like deep down, you need it. If you don't have it, you'll have lack. So, and it's also something that AI can never take away from us, which is, which is really cool. So uh, I believe everyone should learn how to give some good bodywork techniques and learn how to touch properly, like well, therapeutically, and or like at least release trigger points. Talk about trigger points. What are those and why do they matter? I think everyone's experienced them, but in case they haven't. I mean, it's just like bound up tissue that creates a blockage in the body. And, like the, and it can create local pain. It can create... Um, radiating pain somewhere else in the body and it's going to be there until it's released so it can you know they can be really bad like uh, like a trigger point in the SEM can like create really bad headaches vertigo visual disturbances even vomiting so if you have these things stuck in the body it's not good like your whole and especially if you see a physio they believe everything is due to, you know, muscular imbalances. They want to strengthen the weak muscles, stretch the tight muscles and release the trigger points. And that's how you like create harmony in the body. Then train the person how to breathe and, you know, give them the cues that they need to, you know, exhale and create space to breathe in these proper emotions. So yeah, the breath is like foundational with this stuff. And it sounds like if you have a... a faulty breathing pattern, then after your session, you're going to be, again, exacerbating those issues and imbalances. So it sounds like breath is fundamental to not only get the most out of it, but then to maintain those benefits in the future as well. Most definitely. Like the first thing I'll teach everyone how to do when I see them is how to breathe. It's the, it's the most important. Even people who believe they know how to breathe, like need help. Well, Key, let's do some basic breathing then. Basically, the, the first thing I'll show someone is how to breathe using the diaphragm. So like putting a hand on the chest, put a hand on the belly, and then breathe into this hand without this hand moving at all. For those listening and can't see the video, he's referring to the lower hand, the one on his belly. Yeah, so breathing into the belly without the chest moving at all. In through the nose and out through the nose or mouth using the least amount of effort as possible. Because usually when I tell someone to breathe in, they'll activate their neck muscles, they'll activate their chest. And really, we just want to use the diaphragm. The diaphragm is made to breathe. It is our primary breathing muscle. So we take about 25,000 breaths a day. And if we're not using the diaphragm, then we're using secondary breathing muscles in our neck, chest, and back and rib cage. So that's like 25,000 extra contractions a day of these muscles that don't need to happen. So that, that causes a lot of stress inside the body and a lot of extra 
trigger points and muscle tightness. And yeah, so like diaphragmatic breathing is just like vital. And I'd also imagine that for folks doing the bench press or other like chest exercises, since they're so common, you're just going to build up a layer of muscle and possibly exacerbate things there. Absolutely. And then even just like doing our daily activities, holding a phone, typing on a computer, everything we do is in front of us. So a uh, really big fan of just stretching, stretching the chest and neck, doing nerve flossing is one of my favorite things to do. And yeah, just opening that area because it just creates space to, to breathe with the less effort. And the less effort we use to breathe, the healthier we're going to be. So what are some ways we can work on releasing these trigger points at home? Like, uh, would foam rolling be a good option? Would just self myofascial release type thing? Like, how would you recommend get started? Yeah, I mean, if you feel something tight, like, warm it up a little bit, jam your thumbs in it and breathe and try to exhale the tightness. Like, it's the best way, like, you're probably not going to hurt yourself by doing, trying to release muscles on yourself. And like, maybe you might, you might hurt yourself a little bit if you're like, going too hard in a spot, but it's like, we're so resilient. Like I post a lot of videos teaching people how to do body work. And some people are like scared to actually touch themselves, like actually scared to touch themselves in certain places. And like, we're so resilient. Like, you know, we do so much drugs and partying and lack of sleep. And, you know, we could probably live like to 250, but really like, like, <laughs> but we, we, treat ourselves so bad. We're so resilient. Like we are just so resilient. So yeah, just like I encourage you to just play and try to release things on your own to open yourselves up. But yeah, I love the foam roller. I actually believe it's one of the best self-care tools. I believe it is the number one self-care tool you can have because as we age, our bones lose density and the more gravitational force we put on our skeletal system, the, the denser it's going to be. And the foam roller is really great at doing that. So like if someone goes into space, they lose like 2% bone density every six months, which is a significant amount. So someone has like fibromyalgia, which is like the degeneration of the bones. I'm like, I make sure they get a foam roller and especially rolling out the ribs because there's points that reach around the body and activate all the organs. So Doing a full body foam rolling session is absolutely amazing. It releases a lot of trigger points and pain and it strengthens your, our resilience. It strengthens our skeletal system, reduces a lot of stress. So yeah, I believe the foam roller is like the best self-care tool we can have. Yeah, it strengthens not just those, but also like physical strength. Because what was striking to me when you were speaking earlier is I totally forgot about this, but when you have that tension, the nerve is impinged or compressed a bit the body's safety mechanism is to reduce your potential output to keep you safe. So that's why a lot of professional athletes, high level athletes, they do a lot of body work because once you clear those blockages, then you're able to output your full force. And what is your take on the importance of being gentle? Because I feel like there's two different camps when it comes to body work. There's the camp that's like, the nervous system must accept these changes. So we're going to be very soft and gentle and give it time, especially with like craniosacral therapy. And then there's other camp that's like, we need to go in there hard and fast and make these dramatic changes. And there's, I'm sure, some nuance that I don't yet understand. Yeah, so that's a great question. Like, if you go see an osteopath, like a lot of their techniques are very gentle and like they'll use these intelligent thinking fingers. They have the best anatomy of anyone, by the way. They're very smart. And they'll allow the body to accept the the pressure you're putting in and like let the tissues melt away and go in. It's very gentle and very subtle and allow the body to like realign itself as opposed to doing more physical, which is what I like to do because I'm more of an extreme person and I like feel the changes faster. Uh, and it's just like getting in there and allowing the person to breathe through it. And you might have like, it's more like a, a, an intense workout. And then the next day you might be really sore or like the day of, and then all of a sudden you have like this insane amount of energy. Now this can happen with the gentle treatment too, but it really depends on the person and what their needs are because some people cannot handle this kind of hard treatment. I work with like, people that are ready to do the work 
uh, athletes, like stronger people, uh, people with like a lot more muscle. Um, and then sometimes we just need a gentle treatment. Sometimes it's like life is so intense. My nervous system is so shot. I just want to like, just have a little gentle loving treatment. So like we need both. Uh, but I love to just, you know, attack the problem head on and, 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 yeah. So it's, we, we do need both and there's arguments for why one is better than the other. And that's like, there's, there's going to be arguments for why each medicine is the best medicine too. Right. So it's uh, just being intuitive and finding what you need and what works best for you. Cause you can also look at the, like the older medicines, the Ayurvedic and Chinese in, you can look at their approach to like things in, in general, such as, foods or substances or practices that take our personal constitution further out of balance. And for me, I'm like the more of the fiery type. Like I like it hard and fast and strong and powerful. And so to me, like that that kind of body work, even though it doesn't feel great in the moment, is the kind of I would gravitate towards naturally. But then I'm wondering if I'm already under like heavy stress, I'm probably gonna want to like reduce that, not add another intense thing onto there. And for me, Initially, probably it's going to be more effective to go low and slow. And perhaps when some of the other stressors die down or I'm more in balance than to go with a stronger body work instead. Yeah, exactly. Just recognizing what you, what you need. I know I saw on your website you do something called Psych K. What else are you incorporating into your like, body work and like, holistic health treatments? Yeah, so I'll I do psyche in the ceremonies. Like if someone books a ceremony with me, then it's like they they really want to have a life reset and really do the work. And uh, psyche is an incredible modality on its own because it can allow you to do like what can take you years and years seeing a psychologist or psychotherapist and change your limiting beliefs in minutes. And so it's like, you know, you, you might believe you're not good enough for your whole life because your parents are like, were so hard on you and they just like never praised you the way you need it to make you believe that what you did was enough. And you might have this belief your whole life. Then all of a sudden with like one psych K session in 10 minutes, you, you test that belief, it tests weak. And then you bring yourself into a whole brain state rewire that belief on the spot and then retest and and then boom you just change your brain you just believe that in in minutes you literally rewire that in minutes so super incredibly powerful modality because you can go from believing anything the thing that's holding you back the most in life to rewiring that belief and believing the positive affirmation of that and then all of a sudden you're a different person like that i have never heard of that it sounds like it would it should be in more arsenals yeah i don't know it's not it hasn't blown up i don't know bruce lipton really endorses it if you know him he wrote the biology of belief he talks about it a lot it was created by rob williams who was a a psychologist and then and yeah it's it's taught around the world it's taught around the world but i haven't seen it 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 just hasn't blown up and and i've been using it i think applied kinesiology is similar and that's that's like kind of big but yeah. That's cool. I'm going to have to look more into that. Are there any other techniques or protocols or modalities that you use that aren't as mainstream as you think they should be? Moxibustion. So it's uh, in China, they don't say acupuncture. They say acupuncture moxibustion. And like they, that's like as one's, not, one's considered not better than the other. They're like equals. And moxibustion is burning this herb mugwort around or on the skin to get positive effects and it puts something inside the body so uh, like acupuncture needle will bring awareness to a point and allow the body to heal itself this actually puts something inside the body and it's like antiviral fungal antimicrobial it it warms the body so it boosts the function of all the organs and it and it helps us live longer so the West does not know too much about it. I know a lot of people who haven't heard of it, and I intend to bring it to the West. And I'm working on some things right now 
to to make it bigger here uh but i haven't haven't been pumping it out yet but yeah mox is amazing like it's it's just it's so powerful and yeah the west really does not know about it yet so that's really interesting it has some parallels with a an animal medicine called combo where it's being applied through a burn to the skin and it has profound antiviral antibacterial antipathogen effects in the body yeah that's that's funny because i actually made uh a whole like a cambo wound for cambo with moxa during a session and i did at like specific acupoints like so here at spleen six right here it's like the meeting point of the liver spleen and kidney channel and then i open this i open this with moxa and then burn some cambo the possibilities of like combining all these things are are vast. Yeah, yeah. So I I just love combining the medicines and taking the good things from from all the goods and exploring. So okay, Key, we will start to wind down. Are there any places you'd like to send people who have made it this far, who want to work with you, to check out your content, visit you on the web? Uh, Holistic University on Instagram. Perfect. I'll put a link to that in the show notes for this episode, as well as a link to your website. And if there was a worldwide burning of the books and all knowledge was lost, you get to save the works of three teachers. Who would you choose and why? Lao Tzu, Rumi. Like the teachings from the Bible are good, but like, I don't know, like uh, the, the Bhagavad Gita, like the... I don't know. Buddha, Buddha's teachings are pretty incredible. It's a tough one. My favorite teacher is Lao Tzu. I, I love his works. Like he wrote a book of five thousand words that say so much. And I've, I've, I listen to the audio book often. Stephen Mitchell translation and uh, some verses or like some. I've listened to like a hundred times, hundred hundred plus times, and I don't even understand it until like you know the 111th time or something and i'm like oh my god like it just like sinks into my soul and i'm like really like wow and it's like but yeah the wisdom in that book is just that's my that's my favorite is uh, i love I, I love the teachings of lao tzu amazing i'll have to check that out and the translation makes a huge difference like depending on which translation you read it's it's like the words are already hard enough to digest and assimilate, take some time to like let them percolate. But then the translation that you pick, like that version of it, that interpretation of it is a whole nother like realm also. To go back to our previous thread, the most important self-care tools you'd say are the foam roller. What else? I mean, as a physical tool, really, it's your mind and being able to sit and let the dust settle. Very simple. Any other physical tools that you recommend? Find a movement practice that you love and and play. Like be be able to play and explore your body and find out like which movements that you need to create space inside your body. Cause it's all like we, we get tight and closed and we want to be loose and open. So create space in your body by doing practices that that feel good and that you love because that will give you more enjoyment in life. And the more you enjoy life, then the better the journey is going to be. So, well, Key, what is one thing that your tribe does not know about you? If you know, if you've ever heard of the trailer park boys, uh, I grew up in that trailer park when I was a kid. <laughs> Fun fact. Okay. Well, how would you like to leave people if they've made it this far with us? Any parting wisdom or takeaways? Just enjoy the journey. Simple enough. Key, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Nick. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. I love knowing who's in the 1% committed to reaching their full potential. Comment 1% below so that I know who you are. For all the resources and links, meet me on my website at mindbodypeak.com. I appreciate you and look forward to connecting with you. As a reminder, the information in this video is for information purposes only. Please consult your primary healthcare professional before making any lifestyle changes.